Hello and, and welcome to everyone. Um, this is the Roots and Shoots COP26 event, and we are so happy to have with us three remarkable Roots and Shoots volunteers and examples of the kind of impact and change that young people working through Roots and Shoots can have. Will Sharuhis, Lily Payden, and Alexandra Flitch. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so happy to have you. We're going to have a conversation with Jane, Dr. Jane Goodall, founder of the Roots and Shoots program. And I'd love to hear about some of your experiences, some of your hopes and dreams um, for the future of your work and what COP26 and your experiences and conversations there have meant. So let's start off with, uh, I'd love to introduce Dr. Jane Goodall, who is an inspiration to all of us, um, someone whose hope and enduring belief in the indomitable spirit of, of humans and, and our abilities to make a better future inspires all of us daily. So Jane, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Anna. And just so that people know, Anna is our executive director of the Jane Goodall Institute in the US because um, and she's a very special person. Okay. So carrying on from there, I'm glad I didn't have to learn all your second names. So huge, I'm hugely excited to talk to you, Will and Lily and Alexandra. And for those people who may be listening who haven't the faintest idea what Roots and Shoots is, let me just briefly explain the program because it began in 1991 when I met young people the age that you three are uh, and in countries all around the world, and they seem to be losing hope. And when I talked to them, some of them were depressed, some of them were angry, mostly they were just not seeming to care. And I think you three have also met that same attitude around the world. So I asked them, you know, why are you feeling like this? Well, you've compromised our future, not me personally, but older generations, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, we have for hundreds of years been compromising your future, ever since the Industrial Revolution, actually. But was it true that there was nothing that could be done? No, absolutely not. We've got this window of time, this precious window of time. And Roots and Shoots began with just 12 high school students in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. And they came from eight secondary schools. And they were concerned about all kinds of things going on in the world around them, in their world. And they wanted me to fix everything. I said, well, I'm not even Tanzanian. So they went back to their schools. They found friends, eight schools, found friends who cared about the same sort of things. We had a meeting, I would say 30 young people. And Roots and Shoots was born with the main message, every individual makes a difference every day. And because I learned in the rainforest how everything is interconnected, we decided that each group would choose three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And the amazing thing that's come out of it is that young people, we try to bring young people together face to face if possible, usually virtually, from different cultures, different religions, um, different nationalities, and young people have seemed to just by osmosis understand that far more important than the color of your skin, your language, your culture, or your religion is the fact we're all human beings. Roots and Shoots now in 65 countries and growing, members in preschool, lots in kindergarten, very strong in university and secondary school, everything in between, more and more adults taking part. And all I can say is, firstly, Roots and Shoots is all about planning projects. It's not top down, planning projects to help people, animals and the environment, working out what you can do for your particular passion, rolling up your sleeves and taking action. And all around the world, I'm so proud of the young people because you are changing the world and it's as Anna said, my greatest hope for the future. So I'm really glad that you're there at COP. I'm only there virtually. 
and and now I'm truly looking forward to hearing what you think about COP, what your experience has been. You can be truthful and what your hopes are for the future and what you've been doing. Thank you, Jane. I think that's exactly right. I, I loved what you said too about how Roots and Shoots is a community that connects around the world. Um, Will, Lily and Alexandra do not live in the same area. So they themselves have come together from, from multiple different areas and are a great example of just how effective we can be working with others and defining our communities broader. Um, Will, would you mind taking a, a few minutes here and sharing a little bit about your story, about your projects and about your journey with Roots and Shoots? Sure, okay, so hi Anna, hi Dr. Gunal. It's an honor to be on this call and to actually be here at COP26. Um, I'm a high school student living in Miami. And so we're all members of We Are Forces of Nature, which is a Roots and Shoots group. I've been really interested in the climate since I was younger. And I've been working on summits and working on strikes throughout Miami and it gained traction. And eventually we started talking to our elected, uh, our elected officials about what they need to be doing. And so they began to implement actions such as they, they implemented that Miami is under a climate emergency. And so that led people to start to worry, especially the people who hadn't been interested in this topic previously. And I'm also, I mean, I'm, it's an honor to be here at COP26 and to actually be part of the Roots and Shoots National Youth Leadership Council. And it's just been, it's just been a journey. Great. Thank you, Will. Uh, Lily, would you mind sharing a little bit about your work and your background? So I am a senior at UCLA. I'm from Los Angeles, California. Um, I've been here basically my entire life. And um, working with Forces of Nature has been really special for us because um, as you said, we're all from different parts of the country. So Will being in Miami, um, Alexandra is, uh, she lives in Dallas now and me being from Los Angeles. Um, all of us, you know, from a young age have experienced the effects of climate change despite being in different parts of the country. Um, and that goes for everybody, different parts of the world. So um, that was something that the three of us were really able to kind of bond over, um, again, despite being in different states. So being in Southern California, we have the annual wildfires. Um, they're, they're hotter, hotter and more often um, with each year. My family evacuates our home uh, twice a year, basically. You can kind of count on that. So um, we, we just definitely see the effects of climate change. And that just really got me interested from a young age, I think. The, I really remember the first wildfire really affecting my neighborhood in 2005. So I was five years old. And you know, from then, it just kind of became an ever increasing problem, which really uh, ignited my um, beliefs. And um, I'm also a public affairs major. So I'm kind of working hopefully towards policy and um, you know, government work. So it's just been really fulfilling for me to be able to be at COP and kind of see firsthand what policymakers are really doing um, and giving a microphone to the youth. It's been really special and um, yeah, just, just a really unique opportunity for our group to work together and uh, get exposed to this type of work. It's been amazing for us. Great, thank you, Lily. I, I love your comments too about seeing how governments and policy um, can really have, have widespread change. So that, that's terrific. Um, Alexandra, love to hear, hear you. Hi, I'm Alexandra. Um, it's really nice to meet you both. Um, I live in Dallas, Texas, um, and I started getting involved in um, uh, working against climate change um, when I spent time in the Ecuadorian cloud forest in high school. And that was the first time that I um, really learned the firsthand effects of small communities um, that are dealing with the effects of climate change. Um, and then more recently, um, I was really moved by um, hearing about people in Honduras who were living through years of drought and praying for rain. And then when the rain came, um, it brought with it mudslides and Hurricane Etta and um, disastrous effects from the hurricane. Um, so I worked with Forces of Nature and Roots and Shoots to um, organized hurricane relief and we collected um, you know, the necessary items that they needed and clothes from our communities um, for those um, 
victims of the hurricane. Um, and yeah, and then I've been, you know, obviously like we all do living with different effects of climate change in my own life. Um, recently this year, we had uh, power outages across North Texas um, due to severe winter storms that our city was not prepared for um, because that's very atypical weather for the area. Um, so have been motivated by lots of different things across my life and across the world. Thank you for that. You've, you've each shared a really personal motivation behind the work that you do and that we are forces of nature. I, I don't think you could have picked a better name. Um, I, I have a question to everyone and, and Jane, I'd love if you could start us off. I'm curious to hear your perspective about what does the climate crisis, why, what does it mean to you and, and why should it matter to everyone? Well, it matters to me because up until the pandemic, I was traveling all around the world and I was actually meeting people who had been desperately affected by climate change. That is by the changing weather patterns that we find all around the world. The worst hurricanes, the worst flooding, the worst wildfires. Um, and I remember standing in Greenland with some Inuit elders and it was late winter and they were saying the ice here, we were looking up at that great ice cap and they were saying even in summer the ice never melted here and the ice was, the water was pouring out of the ice cliff. Icebergs were breaking off, carving they call it, into the ocean and it just so happened that I went straight from there to Panama and there I actually happened to meet people who even back then, and this is about eight years ago, they had had to leave their island homes because they were no longer habitable at high tide because of rising sea levels as the water expands through through the, the heating and also the icebergs and the glaciers melting and adding volume to the ocean. And then I saw a film and I've seen a lot of films about climate change. But this was about what was happening in Bangladesh and it moved me so much and proud people who'd made their living farming and a bit of fishing, their land has gone away. It's being eaten away by high tide and by the flooding of the Ganges because of the unusual monsoons and because India is making dams to suit themselves. And when the monsoon comes, they release the dam, which takes away the shores of the river for Bangladesh. So once proud people now having to go and live in the city and they have to live in slums and there's no electricity, there's no sanitation, no latrines and uh, no clean water. And it was just heartbreaking. And this is what's going to happen more and more and more. So for me, it's not just the fact that so many animals are being affected. If they can't adapt, if they can't move away to a cooler place, then they're going, they're doomed. And we are in the midst of the sixth, of the eighth, sixth great extinction. So I just feel it very personally. I've seen a lot of it. I've talked to people and my heart aches. You're bringing up a topic of climate refugees. You've, we've heard that kind of um, phrase used to describe exactly what you're referring to here, that the climate changes so dramatically that one's livelihood and, and way of life that preceded them for generations, eons before, is no longer sustainable. Um, and, and that climate refugee. Jane, you mentioned um, Panama serving an important part of that journey. And Alexandra, I know you mentioned um, some of your journey in the cloud forest. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the same question of what does the climate crisis mean to you personally? And, Similarly, why should anyone else care? It's incredibly heartbreaking to hear the stories of people who um, have, especially people who have had almost no um, uh, uh, con contributions to climate change, who have contributed the least among the world and are feeling the impacts in the largest ways, losing their homes, losing their ability to make a living, um, 
And so hearing from people um, in Ecuador who have um, seen you know, the changes that are causing um, extinction of various different species of animals who are um, unique to the cloud forest there, um, hearing about the people in Honduras who are losing their homes and losing everything. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking to hear about, especially when you think about uh, how innocent they are in the, in the crisis. Um, and, and it's important for me personally to be able to do what I can to know that I, I am not contributing to that more than, more than um, possible. Um, it's, um, I, I just feel like we all need to do our parts to um, try to make sure that we are stopping this in any way that we can, um, because it's, it's heartbreaking. You just touched on something, which Jane, I'd love, I'd love for you to sh ex share a little bit more about something that Jane frequently says, um, and and is a I know a, a guiding um, ethic and an approach of that we all have that personal responsibility, and every individual matters. Um, Jane, I don't know if you want to share a little bit more about how you came to that that understanding and, and what that can mean for all of us in the in the situation in which we find ourselves. Well, I don't really know, Anna, what 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 brought it to my attention, but <clears throat> it was even before Roots and Toots began. And it it's just that each single one of us, you know, we all have our own lives, we have our own paths. And I got so frustrated by the selfishness, by the waste um, by the way people were harming the planet. And I think I felt this very strongly because I grew up during World War II when everything was rationed, when you took nothing for granted. You didn't take food for granted. You didn't take clothing for granted. You didn't take human life for granted. My, our family <coughs> and friends were being killed. And, you know, for a time, it seemed that for, for England there was no hope because every country in Europe had been either defeated or capitulated. And we were the only country standing up against the might of Nazi Germany. Just with a little bit of barbed wire and scaffolding, we were not prepared for war. And if we hadn't had Churchill, whose speeches roused the British people to a pitch of saying, we will not be defeated. And everyone pitched in and did their bit and all the different war efforts, working on the land, working in the factories, somehow we, we succeeded in defeating Hitler. What you just mentioned there, the role and importance of inspiring people and giving hope, and that's something that, that Jane does so beautifully and so wonderfully. Um, Lily, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your experience at COP26 and, and how you've been inspired or how you've helped others in, in the conversation and, and would just love for you to share about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so at COP26, I think that one of our main takeaways is um, how personal and emotional a lot of the conversations have been um, amongst uh, the speakers that we've been able to listen to. And I think that, um, you know, uh, COP has taken some heat in the in the first couple of days for being a little performative. Um, and I think that they are trying to amend that, um, at least in the uh, conferences that we've been able to attend. So um, there have just been a lot of personal conversations from perhaps uh, just smaller countries um, that we've been able to hear from. Um, and people have really expressed, you know, in past years and past conferences, we've been uh, made promises to help our nations and help uh, combat climate change. And we haven't seen a lot of deliveries on those. And seeing those types of conversations, like being able to witness that firsthand, um, is just very vulnerable. Like it, it, it puts these leaders of these countries in very vulnerable positions um, for their people that they represent. And in my experience, there is hope and although there is, um, again, a lot of emotion and eco anxiety um, we've discussed and a, a lot of people are angry and, um, you know, are, are demanding change as they should. 
Um, but there's also a, a lot of hope that I've seen. And again, one of my main takeaways is just inspiration um, from people that are trying to really focus on implementation just besides um, agreements and signatures and all that type of stuff. It really comes down to, okay, we've talked about it. So now what do we do to move forward? And I, after seeing the conferences and speakers that I have so far, um, I definitely am walking away with hope and positivity, um, which I don't know if everybody can say the same. Um, again, just given a lot of general anxious and hopelessness attitudes of some generations, but um, it, it was really special to hear about true implementation. So um, I, I personally feel inspired and hopeful. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lily. Um, Will, could you share a little bit? I know um, we were talking that you've you've had some wonderful experiences to to meet with um, some world leaders at COP, and I'd love to hear about those experiences. Yeah, it was definitely awesome, and especially since we're we're basically the youngest people at COP, especially this year, we were fortunate to be able to sit with or to be able to sit and listen to a panel in, which included President Barack Obama, the president of Fiji, as well as the prime minister of the Marshall Islands and Grenada. And, and it was just, since President Obama's from the island of Hawaii, they all sort of discussed how the island nations aren't emitting carbon and aren't like producing this issue of climate change. But on the other hand, they're facing the worst end of the spectrum. And it's just, it's, it's unfair, it's, it's horrible. And I mean, living, living, in Miami, living in Miami and since my city is like right on the coast, we're sort of starting to experience these issues firsthand with sea level rise. I mean, who knows in five years, I'm, I might have to move like everyone else has been. Well, that's a great point, Will. And I know that you've been working with some um, ways to, to help combat um, the, the coastlines and, and make sure that those forests are intact with, with mangroves. Yes, so I've been in charge of doing a couple of mangrove cleanups and restor restoring the mangroves as well as planting mangroves in my backyard to do, I mean, we're all trying to do everything we can. And the, these projects, like everyone can do it. So I'm trying to find the right people and find the right people who can also find their friends or people they know who can all join and make this big group of people who love the earth and who wanna just make a better planet and do everything we can. Jane, when you hear Will say that about just looking for others to join in, that to me sounds like one of the most beautiful aspects of Roots and Shoots. Yes, I think it is. And, you know, I think one of the reasons that it's growing so fast is partly because young people are able to choose what they get involved in. And um, secondly, because we do a lot of partnering, we collaborate, we work with other youth groups who have the same sort of vision and, and mission and values. And you know, the goal is to make a family all around the world, a family of human beings who care about the future. And one of the great things about Roots and Cutes, because it began in 91, we now have people who joined in high school and they're now out in the big wide world. And somehow they all seem to take with them the values that they, that they acquired in the program. So the last time I went to China, I think five different adults came up to me in different places and basically all said, well, of course we care about the environment and animals. We were in roots and shoots in primary school. And that is all around. And I'll give one example. The environment minister in Tanzania during the, uh, <clears throat> the last presidency, he's dead now, he denied COVID-19 and died of COVID-19, which is some kind of poetic justice. And he decided to build a dam in a world heritage site which would destroy huge areas of one of the most pristine areas of Tanzania and of course there was a lot of opposition 
and he announced on public radio that anyone who opposed this dam would suffer the consequences. So the Minister of the Environment did oppose the dam and he was very, very lucky not to lose his life, but only his job. That's incredible. That kind of courage um, is just absolutely remarkable. Um, Roots and Shoots is a program that a lot of youth become involved in, but as we've heard from Jane and, and as we all know at the Jane Goodall Institute, it's not just for youth, anyone can join. But I'd love to hear from Lily and Alexandra and Will about what it's been like representing a youth voice at COP26 and how that experience and, and what that's been like representing the youth voice. Um, and happy to, Will, would you like to start with that? First off, I just want to say um, on Saturday, I spoke on a panel and it was youth, it was basically a youth panel and it was really awesome to be able to, to be able to actually be speaking, give my opinion and what I believe we should do. Because I mean, it's, it's going to be our generation that really faces the, the, the hardships of climate change. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. And I feel like the youth are not getting the representation they need in this issue. And I, I, I just feel like we're not getting representation because I mean, a lot of policymakers think, oh, they're young. They don't understand. They, it, it's just, I don't understand why they do that because it's, it's not true. Like even though we're youth, we understand not only understand, but as you just pointed out, Will, it is your future. And it is the world in which you and, and those behind you will be living. And as Jane pointed out in her example, be the decision makers for. Um, Lily, do you have anything that you'd like to add about that as representing the youth voice or the voices of the future at COP? So at COP, we've just been able to have really meaningful conversations and you know, you're waiting in line to get into some conference room and um, striking up conversations just with other young people. And um, it, it's just really inspirational, as I've said earlier, just to talk to people who share similar passions and understand uh, the severity of the situation and the urgency of policy um, and things like that. So uh, just giving a microphone to the youth, um, such as Will's panel that he was able to speak out on, um, on Saturday is so important. And yeah, as, as Will said, we do understand and we live it. So, you know, older generations and my parents and my grandparents, they're all evacuating from our fires, but I am too. And, you know, hopefully in the next couple of decades, um, a lot of us want to have families of our own. And as you said, just um, the people who, um, you know, are experiencing it and living in our world after us as well. So giving the youth a voice is, um, you know, one of the most important things that we can do right now as we are graduating from college and entering the workforce. And hopefully, um, you know, we are also educating our next gen generation of policymakers. So I think that all of that um, just builds on each other and it's so important for future generations. Um, so yeah, I just think that the youth has been really inspirational. Um, and, you know, again, people are angry and people are demanding and they should be. I think Obama made a statement, it was either at COP last year or this year, but he said, you know, keep that anger, keep that passion and, you know, just push as hard as you can. Um, I read that in an article and again, I can't remember if it was in Madrid or Glasgow, but he just, you know, speaking to the youth, he, he said, please like keep up that energy because it's what we need and it's our whole future. So it's really important. That's great. Thank you. And Alexandra, I'd love to hear some thoughts that you might have on how young people can get involved in climate issues without feeling overwhelmed. I think that's definitely one of the um, hardest things or the most intimidating things about this issue is that um, it does feel and is bigger than all of us. Um, and I know there was a lot of you know, eco-anxiety is the term that was expressed by lots of youth at COP. Um, the fear that this is a hopeless cause and that you know, there's nothing we can all do. It's all dependent on the policymakers, but I think it's really important to remember um, that we all do have an effect um, and we're all, you know, can either choose to have a negative effect on this planet each day or a positive effect. 
um, and trying to do whatever you can, whether that's recycling, eating vegan, things like that, or um, getting involved and you know, attending a conference or attending a strike or signing a petition. There's a lot of things that we can all be doing in our own homes and um, helping communities around us that will make a big difference if we can all come together and, and do them. And I want to add something there about what young people are doing, because I think it's very important. I was talking to the CEO of a big international corporation a couple of weeks ago, and his corporation has changed radically over the past seven years from being really damaging to the environment, um, not having an ethical attitude towards its workforce, not really caring about the supply chain from where the, where the produce was, was taken until when it comes to market. And he said to me, Jane, the reason that we've changed, there's three reasons actually. He said, first of all, I saw the writing on the wall that in some places we're using finite natural resources faster than nature can replenish them. And if we continue doing that business as usual, that's the end of my business and basically the end of us. Secondly, he said, consumer pressure. People are more and more aware, more and more demanding that products be produced in an ethical way, asking questions about palm oil and, and um, you know, different kinds of forestry products. Was it from a, a plantation? Or was it from destroying an old growth forest? But he said, finally, the thing that tipped the balance for me was when my 10 year old daughter came home from school one day and she said, Daddy, they tell me that you are hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet and I'm going to grow up into the planet. Please tell me you're not hurting the planet. And that got to the heart. And that's the message that I have for all young people is stories that reach the heart. And anger, yes, I can agree that we need anger, but not to show the anger, to use the anger to fuel action, to make you say, I will not give up like we did in Britain in the war. We were angry at the Nazis, we hated them, but we used that anger to do everything we could to defeat Nazi Germany and to stand strong. And of course, the indigenous people who've been protecting their indigenous forests for so long, they're risking and losing their lives as they stand up to fight for justice. That's exactly right. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for, for that important reminder and, and strong, strong advice about moving forward. Um, and for these Roots and Shoots members, as you continue in your work, please keep these words and, of wisdom and experience in mind. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for being at COP26. And most importantly, thank you for all of your work through Roots and Shoots, which truly is inspiring many, many more than you will ever realize. And that ripple effect is broad. So thank you to everyone who, who tuned in and listened today. Um, and together we can, and together we will. <laughs>